So, okay, I think the technical difficulties are over. We can start our talk. Uh, everyone knows the speaker today. He's an old member of RCAM, Paris Kokos. We are very happy to have him occasionally here. Of course, he will be speaking about Hamiltonian chaos. And the title is already on the screen, Numerical Approaches for Investigating the Chaotic Behavior of Multidimensional Hamiltonian Systems. Paris, go on. Yeah, thank you so much, Panos. It's really a pleasure to be back here. Yeah, uh, many, many years I was part of uh, of the Institute, so not, not, it is better not to say how many years because it shows our age, but uh, yeah, it's, it's really a pleasure to be back. And as you know, one of the things that I prefer I like, I like to do my uh, to focus my research is numerical techniques for mm -hmm. Hamiltonian systems. So what I'm trying to do today is to give you an overview of or remind you some techniques that you might have already heard about or some new ideas about how we can investigate Hamiltonian chaos, but focusing on multidimensional Hamiltonian systems. Uh, and as you will see, I will refer to systems describing uh, a couple of nonlinear oscillators. As an example, the focus will not be the, 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 the physics of the model itself, although I will refer to that, but mainly I will try again. Yeah. Okay, so it was, I will try to focus on the techniques. So here is an outline of my talk. As I said, initially I will describe the, the model that I will be applying all the different techniques, which is a, a Klein Gordon lattice, and I will explain it. Uh, what that means with disorder, a system of coupled nonlinear oscillators, and then the different techniques which I will present, remind, or introduce uh, are highlighted in, in red, and also they are able to give you different features of the dynamics. So the first thing that I will refer to is the maximum Lyapunov of exponent, which I'm pretty sure I don't need to introduce that in this audience, which gives you an idea of the strength of chaotic behavior, then I will focus on what is called deviation vector distributions, an idea which might be useful in order to understand the mechanism that, that introduces or propagating chaos in these systems. Uh, I will also use the frequency map analysis, which is a very well established technique, especially in people working in celestial uh, the, um, mechanics and uh, uh, dynamics, which will help us to Get, get a characterization of the spatial temporal evolution of chaos in this system. And at the end, I will refer to another chaos detection techniques that we have been introduced many, many years ago, the generalized alignment index, which we will use in order to discriminate between local, uh, localized and, and uh, spreading chaos. So let's start with the model. Uh, as I said, the thing that you have to remember is that I have a system which are nonlinear oscillators. And you see that here, the Hamiltonian has a kinetic part, which is the PLI, uh, PL square over two. And then there is uh, the potential. And as you see, we have terms <coughs> related to the on-site potential, the two next terms, because they depend on the position of our oscillator. L is counting the number of particles. Typically, we in this numerical, uh, simulation that I will present, we are talking about systems with one to 4,000 particles. So there, there's a really large Hamiltonian model. Then there is an interaction with nearest neighbors. And of course, the red term there is the nonlinear term because otherwise the potential would be, a, the system would be described as a set of uh, coupled uh, harmonic oscillators. So as I said, we have this system and we also have another degree of complexity, which is disorder. And disorder means the following. This uh, parameter epsilon L tilde that you see in the second term is a constant term for every oscillator, but does not have the same value for every oscillator. The idea behind that is that this kind of models are used in order to study the propagation of energy in solid, uh, in solid state uh, systems. So, but there we have impurities, imperfections, so everything is not as uh, exactly the same. So that's what we are trying to mimic in this model by having this epsilon taking random values in that interval 
which means that it does not have the same exact value for every oscillator, but they are not that different. And when we create, let's say if we have a system of 1000 oscillators, when we create this sequence of 1000 random numbers, oscillator one has this epsilon, which is 0 0.35 or 75, whatever. This number remains constant throughout the numerical simulation, but this is called what, we, uh, what is uh, this called a uh, disorder realization of the system. And then we will do another numerical simulation using another sequence of 1000 uh, numbers and so on and so forth in order to get some statistics uh, after uh, out of this numerical simulation. So in order to write down the Hamiltonian, we have a random number generator that takes value for epsilon and yes. from this value yeah. and then yeah. So, so next time we're gonna uh, study the same problem, then we will have another Hamiltonian essentially. Another Hamiltonian, but yeah, another Hamiltonian, but with some uh, similar properties, which is the same. Uh, everything else will be the same, but the but on site potential will not be exactly the same. The range of values has a meaning. Here. So the range of values is chosen like that in order to be able to. Uh, correspond this system with another very well studied system, which is the discrete nonlinear uh, Schrodinger equation. So, and the result that I will present from for the physics in, in some sense of the dynamics of the model itself uh, are similar there. So that means it gives a confidence that what we are seeing has some general properties. That's why we have chosen this strange uh, number of uh, uh, this strange numbers of the, of the interval. Was this, I think, that... to ask why you don't have a similar factor for the U uh, to the fourth. Well, we, look, uh, actually, you can play with the, the disorder because this is this is what we call the disorder. The disorder is there. You can play the, with the disorder in, in many different ways. You can also put it there. Another natural option will be to put it in this term, which is the the, uh, the interaction with nearest neighbors. So here we have done that, but obviously you can do more complicated or different things, but in the same spirit. Uh, yes, I think that this uniform distribution sounds strange for me in a solid state system. In a solid state system, I would expect regions to have different values or spot regions to have different values, not from oscillator to oscillator change. Yeah, actually, that, that, that's a very good question. Uh, in order to do things more realistic, you can also do uh, we have not done that ourselves, but other groups, you can take this chain of oscillators and then you have in one part, yes. 100 sites, let's say, with some, some distribution, and then the, other. the other with a different distribution or maybe order without any difference. And there have been this, this numerical simulation also there. Okay, so I think that from this discussion, you understand also the the physical motivation be behind studying this, this model. And here I'm just saying that if you neglect the red term, the nonlinear term, then this is a system of coupled the harmonic oscillators and you can have the, the normal mode, you can find the frequencies of the, of the uh, oscillators, the distribution of the frequencies. And we know from the work of Anderson that if this order is strong enough, then for the linear system, we have localization, which means that the energy that you, the excitation that you will do will remain localized in some region of the, of the lattice. But the question that we were trying to answer, and it is not really seen here, is what happens if we have nonlinearity, which means adding, for example, in this simple approach, this term or other terms will uh, will disorder be destroyed? So that is the motivation. This is the model. But as I said, I will focus, I will present also the different dynamical behaviors that we have seen here. But mainly I'm focusing on presenting the techniques and giving you an idea how we can use these techniques, numerical techniques, in order to understand the, the dynamics of any Hamiltonian system with many degrees of freedom, of course, with. Also, this, this uh, technique can be applied to systems with lower degrees of freedom, but it is more complicated to have a multi-dimensional Hamiltonian system because you cannot have really easy inspection of, of the phase space, for example. Okay, <clears throat> so what we do in that system, we have energy distributions, normalized energy distributions. So we are attributing energy per side. We create a distribution. And then if we have a distribution, you can compute the second moment, which is telling you how far away the energy distribution 
is going. So usually, typically, what we do is we excite something in the, at the center of our lattice, either one single site excitation or some uh, or lat uh, some lattice points that will be excited, and then we see how this energy is distributing in time. And another quantity that we measure is what is called participation number. It is defined like that. And this is a number which gives you an, a rough idea of how many oscillators, how many sites are highly excited. So the extreme two cases is if you have a single site excitation, you do this computation, you will find that P is one. If you have equipartition, then you will find that P is written behind that. P is equal to N, the, the, all the degrees of freedom. Of course, in numerical simulation, you will have something in between. So if I have a participation number in the largest of 1,000 sites, 200 that I understand that roughly, whatever that means, one fifth of the of the lattice is highly excited. Okay, so <clears throat> just a brief. I don't want to spend much time in the details here. Uh, a, a, a brief description of the different dynamical regimes that we are expecting and actually seeing in this model. As I said, the idea is we have some excitation at the center, and we see how the energy is propagating. If it remains localized, it will propagate uh, forever up to uh, the times that we can uh, achieve with uh, uh, computer simulations. So <clears throat> we have practically three uh, different regimes. If the nonlinear shift of the, uh, of the modes, the, which means the change in the frequencies introduced due to the fact that the system becomes nonlinear is rather small, then what we have, we have a theoretical exp expectation that the second moment will grow with t to the one to the power one third. And this is also seen in, in, in the in simulations. And if it is a little bit larger, then we have something, a transient case where initially the second moment, the spreading is faster with following a t to one half. And then after some time, we have some crossover to the previous dynamical regime. So here we call the regime weak chaos because the spreading is weaker, slower. This is called strong chaos. And then if the nonlinearity is big enough to have detuning of the, of the modes, then we actually have what is called self-trapping regime, which happens, which means the following. Most of the energy remains localized, resembling to Anderson localization, but there, are, there is a part, not a negligible one, which is propagating. But the idea is that the majority, the majority of the energy remains localized. So, <clears throat> what I would like to you to keep from that is that mainly we have two spreading regimes with different exponents in the second moment and with some different characteristics. And we will try to understand more the details of how this two dynamical behaviors appear in our system. That's that's the goal of what I will present. And just to confirm what I just what I said a, a few minutes ago, what we are doing is uh, we have some initial block excitation of some central part. We let it evolve and we see the distribution of the energies and we compute the quantities like the second moment. So here we have numerical results of Average over 1,000 realizations. What Panos described earlier, we create one disorder realization. We let it run up to 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 time units, which is a huge task. It's a couple of days of computation. Then we repeat that for another realization. And we have 1,000 uh, simulation like that. We are averaging for the different energies, which the energies uh, actually defining the strength of the nonlinearity. And what we see here is there is this average over realization. There is a shade region, which is not very clear, maybe in the red, which because we are averaging the second moment of all these realizations. And you see the different behaviors for the uh, uh, weak chaos case, which is the blue one. And what we do here is we compute numerically the slope of this curve. And we see that the slope goes to the predicted uh, exponent one third. For the green one, which is the strong chaos case, we see what we would expect from the theory. It goes to one half and then slowly shows the tendency to decrease. This is the self-traveling, which is not that interesting for us at this stage because we are 
investigating more also the, the spreading behavior. Of yeah. course, here you but see. Uh, <laughs> there are any uncertainties in those particular diagrams because you have averaged over. Yeah, yeah. Other That's the, this this shading oh, okay. is is one standard deviation, Excellent. but it is not really seen. But here it is something like that. There is a shading which is one standard deviation of the average quantities that you are presenting. Yes, thanks. Yeah, I was more interested about the indices, the lower lot over there, to see uh, whether they are significantly or insignificantly, insignificantly different from the other. Yeah, look, that, that, that's also a good point. So, what we are doing here is we are taking the blue, the average curve, we are considering it accurate, and then we are just computing the slope. And we, what, and of course, there the technique is that you are using some points of, of the average curve. You do a, a, a fitting, and you, of course, if you play with how many points you you com will consider, this the results will slightly change, but not the main behavior that we are seeing here. So I think here we are we are doing an average having taken eleven or thirteen points in the, of this curve, and we have seen that this number is good enough to present to show results that they do not change with the, the, the approach that so we are confident that this has a meaning okay well thanks that's that's a good question about the validity of the results of if this has a meaning or it is just the numerical way that uh, we are doing it of course the definition is clear in this definition because i know for according to it must take the argument of spectrum yeah, there are different communities using the term strong chaos and weak chaos in different ways. Uh, that's why, to be frank, this this, this work has been done in 2008, 2010, 2012. So the term was not the best choice that we made, but it, it stuck. So, <clears throat> yeah, in some cases, strong chaos means that more than one Lyapunov exponents are positive. So yeah, yeah. people call it also hyper chaotic or things like that. So here, what we are saying is strong and weak chaos is related to faster or slower spreading. But we will see that there is there are some interesting difference between the two regimes. That, and that's what we try to reveal with the, the numerical techniques that we will present. OK. <clears throat> OK, the first thing that we are computing is the maximum Lyapunov exponent numerically. And again, I'm pretty sure that everybody knows how to do that here. And what we know is that if we have regular motion, then the Lyapunov exponent sh should be zero. The maximum Lyapunov exponent should be zero. We have regular motion. The estimator, which is the finite time Lyapunov exponent, should go to zero following practically a power law of the form t to the minus one. And in the case of chaotic motion, then this should be positive. And this is one of the first numerical computations of Lyapunov exponents for a system from Benetin and collaborators in, in the 80s. So chaotic behavior in log log scale, regular behavior. That's what we know. Now, if we do, and again, I remind you, we have 1,000, let's say, oscillators. We excite a few, 10 in the middle, and we see how the energy is propagating, and we're computing the Lyapunov exponent for this uh, for this uh, chain. And here we have one particular disorder realization. It is just a representative one from, from the weak chaos case. That's not that important from what I want to say. So you see here the evolution of the second moment in log log scale, and we see have the slope minus uh, one third. It's quite good. The participation number, the expectation is one six. Again, good, fine. Here is the Final snapshot of the uh, of the uh, distribution of the energy in log scale. So we have this kind of chapeau-like uh, behavior with uh, some sharp uh, decreases. And of course, in this particular case, the, the system has more than one thousand uh, oscillators. It was, I think, it was two thousand. So you see, it, it is covering some range. But here we have very small numbers, ten to the minus sixteen, which means practically zero. Now, if we compute the Lyapunov exponent for this numerical uh, experiment, we will see that the Lyapunov exponent goes to zero, but with a slope, or decreases, let's put it this way, I do talk about decreases, but with a slope which is not minus one. If you have minus one, this will imply regular motion. So here, what we see is that 
The system becomes less chaotic as time is propagating, but the slope is not minus one, which means that it's not regular. And this was one case, and then we did similar thing for some uh, averages. So here we have 100 realization for each case, different parameters for our models. And uh, these are the weak chaos cases according to our definition, the strong chaos cases. Here we see the average curves of the Yabudov exponents. And here we see the slopes of this curve, the numerical continued slopes. Right, if it is not minus one, then we have a behavior that is uh, somehow descending regular like this not like this. Well, it is not like this. I, I, I will explain in a minute. So first of all, what is interesting here is that the two different dynamical regimes have two different numbers. They are close by, but they are this, uh, not the same. So why this particular numbers, we do not have a theoretical explanation, but this is a clear difference in, in these two systems. And as you said, it's not one case. We have considered different cases, which different parameters, energies, and disorder strength, things like that. Now, what will, what we, how can we interpret that? The system is chaotic, but as time goes on, it becomes less chaotic. Chaos is uh, not that strong. And this is not difficult to understand because we have a system with 1000 degrees of freedom. The energy, the total energy is preserved. We have a conservative system. So if we excite 10, 10 sites, then these 10 sites initially are chaotic, while the remaining 990 are not. So <clears throat> this is quite chaotic in that region. As the, the, the distribution propagates, the energy become, is distributed to more and more sites. So the energy per site, active site, becomes smaller. So the oscillators are still chaotic, but since they, we have more weakly chaotic oscillators, the overall behavior becomes less chaotic. So you understand that the, the non-linearity is the total energy is distributed to more and more sites and the energy per site becomes smaller. So what is happening is all sites, the, the overall behavior is chaotic, but <clears throat> the system becomes weakly, weakly chaotic because it is going to more, more localized in the area of the phase space. Yes, exactly that. Of but course, within this area where it is localized, it can be very chaotic. It is chaotic, right? but yeah, but it's we are like having Hamilton between, uh, let's say, uh, one kind of section between two invariant curves, and between the two invariant curves, you cannot go outside, yes. but within that, yeah. this can be uh, actually this is this, this is exactly what is happening, as you said. When I have 1,000 degrees of freedom, I'm treating this system as 1,000 degrees of freedom system, but most of the oscillators are dead, they don't have any energy. So only a part of the oscillators, or if you translate it to phase space, only a part of the phase space has motion, the other is dormant. So that's that's what we are, we are seeing here. And this is reflected into the fact that as the, the non-linearity is distributed to, to more sites, <laughs> the energy per site which is the active nonlinear strength becomes smaller and smaller. So the overall behavior becomes become less chaotic because more sites come into play. And this is reflected in the fact that the Lyapunov exponent, which shows the overall uh, strength decreases, but the slope is not minus one because that would mean regular motion. So that's, that's the, now, okay. I think that that's somehow clear. Now, the next thing is, we did is the following. How you compute the Yabunov exponent? You take one perturbation in all coordinates. This is a deviation vector, and you compute the length of this deviation vector through the length of the deviation vector. You are finding the maximum Yabunov exponent. But this vector is telling you, as you let it evolve, uh, where the sensitivity of the system is larger, in which direction, in which degrees of freedom I will have more, the, the small changes will become more significant. So in other words, what we thought is that this could be used as an indicator to show us at a particular time, which part of the lattice is more chaotic, more unpredictable if you want. So what we are doing is we are taking the 
this vector, which has coordinates changes in positions and momenta. We take the position and momenta for each uh, oscillator. We are, we are dividing with the total, which typically is one. And then we have a distribution of which directions, which oscillators, the, the vector in which, in which directions, in which oscillators, the vector has larger uh, values, which at a, will, at a certain time, because this is changing. So this will give you, and this is what a, a snapshot, this, the previous case, the green is the energy, and the blue is the distribution of what we call deviation vector distribution. So here, you see that in this region, in this oscill uh, oscillator, the deviation vector is larger. The projection of the deviation vector in this uh, uh, subspace, if you want, of the fa full phase space is larger, which means if you perturb that, the effect will be more significant. In other words, at this time, this region is more chaotic, more unpredictable, more sensitive. Maybe that's the best way to see that in, in perturbations. So we were trying to use this idea in order to see which part is more chaotic at a particular time. And here we have weak and strong cases, representative cases, but let me go through, let's say, take this one. So here we have the energy, the heat map of the energy, which have initial excitation here, this is time, and you see the color is, the energy is spreading, this white curve is just the middle, the average energy position, that's fine. And here you have three snapshots, green, black, and red, and you see that as we go further in time, the shape is more or less the same, a chapeau like behavior, but more and more sides are into play. Of course, this is log scale. Just keep that in mind. So here we have energy of the order of 10 to the minus 3. Now, in that part, we have the deviation vector, the distribution of the deviation vector. First of all, <clears throat> you see that the deviation vector is more concentrated. And here you see again the three snapshots, and you see that more or less the shape is the same, very pointy, very localized, but it is moving in different areas. So at the green time is here, the red time it is there. So it is moving inside the excited part. So, and it is not spreading that much. It remains localized. Of course, if you see here, this extent is smaller than that extent, but don't forget that we have log scale, so practically it means that it is quite localized. You see that also here. For example, the green one is more, less extended than the red one, but you do not really see a huge difference there. So this idea can show you that at every time, a, a small number of sites are highly excited, but which but this side do not remain the same as we propagate. So what is happening is the energy is spreading, but we have some chaotic hotspots of more or less the same number of oscillators, which is moving inside the excited part. And that's how we have a, the spreading and the homogenization of the chaotic behavior. And that's the main result here. And of course, we can also, if we have a distribution, we can compute the second moment of the deviation vector now, or the participation number of the deviation vector now. And we see that the participation number is interesting. You see that the participation number in strong and weak cases remains more or less constant. Here it is log scale, it is one to 1.2, that means 10 sites or up to 20. So it is quite localized. The same is it's here. This is another manifestation of the fact that we observed earlier that more or less the same the number of highly excited sites is fixed or small. And also we see as time pass by, because the energy is spreading to more and more sites and we want to equally to distribute the chaoticity everywhere, this localized distribution should move further and further away. That's what we see there that we have higher oscillators and oscillations and we can also uh, somehow measure the extent of the oscillation. But I think that these are details. The idea here, what I would like you to, to keep in mind is that probably this deviation vector distribution can identify the more chaotic parts of our system in a particular time. 
that's that's the idea behind that. Now, another well-known and used chaos detection technique is, among other things, you can use that for chaos, is the frequency map analysis. So the idea here is the following. If we have a motion of, if we have motion which is regular, then we have in general quasi-periodic motion. That means that if I take an observable, whatever that might be, positions and momenta of one oscillator or a bunch of oscillators, and I have the signal. So I have a signal. If I have a signal and this signal uh, originates from regular behavior, that means that if I take a part of the signal, do a frequency, uh, do a Fourier analysis, find the, the main frequency, the fundamental frequency, the frequency with the largest amplitude, this will remain practically constant throughout time. In the case of chaos, the, if the signal is chaotic or is originating from a chaotic behavior, you can still have a time series. You, you take a, this time series, you do some Fourier analysis, you find the frequency, you will find the frequency. Of course, there are also other frequencies, but the main frequency with the largest uh, amplitude. But if you repeat this computation, there's no reason for these frequencies to be the same. So what we are doing here, and of course, this comes from Jacques Lascar and collaborators. So what we are doing here, we have a time window. We take another time window next to it of the same length. We compute the frequency, the main frequency here, the frequency there. This is F1 and F2. We do it for every oscillator. So we are taking this, the motion of every oscillator. And we find the difference. OK, we try to somehow normalize it, but that's not the goal. We, we find the difference. If this difference is small, because it's numerical computation, that means that the frequency is practically constant. That means regular motion. If the, frequency, the differences are is large, are large, then we have chaos. Take a large enough uh, yes. window in order to see frequency. Yeah. So actually, we have played. I mean, we have defined some time window with, with, which is rather large in order to see that. The frequencies, the main frequencies, do not change that much for the regular cases because for the chaotic, of course, they change. And of course, the other thing is we need but not too large, not too large, because we also want to see how things evolve in time. And yeah, that's 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 correct. So if you do that, we have these results. So let's see here what we have. We have this is time here. Let's let's stay here. This is the time, and this is the sites that we have. And if, and here we are coloring the sites according to this quantity D, which is the difference of the frequencies. And this is done in log scale. So minus eight means tens to the minus eight. It means that the two frequencies are different at the ten, eighth digit, which practically means constancy. That means black regions or deep uh, purple regions are regular. These oscillators at the edges behave regularly. And <clears throat> large differences means chaos. And you see these yellow or orange here regions are more chaotic. And <clears throat> again, it is interesting to see that as we move on in time, an oscillator could have somehow different phases. It's not that clear here. So here we have something which is red becomes a little bit blue, less chaotic, stronger chaos, things like that. What are the what is the difference between first row and second row? Here I have time from zero up to 10 to the eight. And then here I have an equally an equal length in time, nine, 10 to the eight, up to 10 to the nine. So just to see how things work in this case. So what we see is that obviously more sides come into play, this extent is increased. <clears throat> the difference here and there, this is a weak chaos case, strong chaos case, is that first of all, the extent of chaos or chaotic analysis uh, is larger. Always the chaotic component, the yellow component is at the middle where the energy is higher. That's true for both cases. But here you see that the edges have more uh, larger where we have more regular motion. The, what is happening is that as we give 
energy to, to these oscillators, the ones that they are at the edge, they take some small energy. Initially, they behave more or less regularly. As the wave packet spreads, they take more energy and then become chaotic. And they, then you see here, this is blue. As time goes on, it becomes red because it yellow because it comes into inside the, the chaotic region. So that's one way of finding differences between the two cases. And then the idea is how we can quantify that. And probably this is the most difficult thing that I have to explain. So I know that I have tired you, but just try to, to be with me here. So these results were very accurate in the sense that we are visualizing changes in the frequency up to 10 to the eight. Okay, now we're a little bit more, more, uh, more modest and we do the following. We divide the, the, the frequency band into beams of somehow larger width, 10 to the minus four. Although we can have more resolution, we just say 10 to the minus four. And if two frequencies are different by 10 to the minus four, we consider them that they are more or less the same. And we want to understand what is happening in time. And what we do is we integrate, we take every oscillator, let's say we stick to one oscillator. I find the frequency for one time window and I see in which beam this belongs. Let's say the frequency is in the beam number five, which means some uh, frequency. Then I compute again for the next one, if I find again something which is in five, I say five appear two times. Then it goes to, an, to oh, frequency six, then six one time. And then after some time, when I have accumulated many different computations, I say in this time window, how many times I have this, I had the same frequency. Out of 100 computations, 60% were the same frequency, the other 40 were different. Right, and this is what we call frequency locking because in the in some sense the frequency was locked, and of course it is a number which is between zero and one, one hundred percent. That means that it will be one if for this time window all the small computations of frequencies were giving you practically the same thing. And then after some time we say, okay, let's restart again. So I forget the computations and I start again. That's why you see here sometimes of vertical lines, because the idea is the following. I would like to capture changes in the dynamics. So I'm starting here, I'm chaotic. And then for a long time, I compute the same frequency. So I behave more or less regularly. And then I can become chaotic again. If I keep all these computations, then this window will disappear because it is small and I will not see that. So what I'm saying is I have smaller intervals, and I see in that smaller interval, if I have frequency locking, that's why, and then I restart the computation. This vertical lines correspond to the restarting. And we can see, for example, in this region, we have something which is high, the frequency changes, sorry, is, sorry, this is the frequency locking, how much time, how many times the frequency is the same. Small numbers means that the frequency is changing fast, so it means chaos. So here, for example, I see chaos, chaos, chaos. And then there is a window where I have black, which means that the frequency at this time more or less remain constant. So again, what we see weak chaos, strong chaos, the same results as before, we see again the same behavior, central, more centralized or wider uh, areas there. But we can also see some kind of patterns of more regular behavior inside. And then we have, we quantified that. Can I ask you yeah. The, slide, the horizontal axis, what is it? Is it time? Time, it is time, yes, okay. sorry. This is the lattice side and this is time. And again, this is 10 to, from zero to 10 to the eight in linear scale. And then another window of the same length from nine, 10 to the eight up to 10 to the nine. So the previous flow that we showed which I presume also had time in the x-axis. Yes, the same thing. Kind of horizontal pattern. So you see some sort of a consistent behavior yes. through time for certain frequency ranges. Yes. Okay. So, okay. Right. yes, that's true. And now we would we see this 
kind of behaviors. And now we would like to quantify a little bit more this thing. So what we are doing here is, again, time windows, weak chaos, strong chaos, from zero to 10 to the eight, from nine, 10 to the eight to 10 to the nine. And here we have how many cases have frequency locking between zero and 0 0.2, the yellow, which means the, ch the, the change is very fast. So it means chaos, strong chaos actually, from 20% uh, to 40% frequency, frequency locking and up to higher values. And if you compute the, and again, you see this vertical pattern because we restart the computation again and again. So if you compare, first of all, you see that the something which was obviously present in the previous plots, but somehow we quantify is that if we compare here and there, you see that the strongly chaotic, the percentage of strongly chaotic sites is larger because the ye yellow, orange, and red, which is also 60% of the time, the frequency was constant. The other 40% was not constant. There was a big component of chaoticity. Here is much larger than there, typically five times more. The other thing that you see is that as we move in time from here to here, from here to here, everything is going down. So the, especially the strongly chaotic component becomes smaller. This is also what we have seen. As time passes by, the energy is distributed to more sites. The chaoticity of sites become smaller. So that's some ideas of how we could quantify, visualize differences between dynamical regimes and also differences in time. It's another way of presenting the results that we saw earlier. And the last part do I have, do I have, let's say, well, five, six minutes? Five. Okay. So the other indicator that we used is the generalized alignment index, but in particular, we consider uh, the version of k equal to two. So the idea here is the following, and it will be very brief. <clears throat> In order to compute the maximum level of exponent, I take one perturbation, one deviation vector, and I see how this is stretching and I compute uh, something. Now, here we are taking more, we are taking k, k different vectors. We let them evolve in time, we normalize, this hat means normalize to one, and then we are chat, not uh, orthonormalized, only normalized. And then we, we try to see if these vectors will align to each, to each other, always still remain different. And here is the volume. This quantity is practically the volume of the parallelogram, generalized parallelogram that I have with, let's say three or four or five vectors. So the bottom line is the following. If we have chaotic motion, this quantity, I don't go into details how we compute that, goes to zero exponentially fast and with an exponent which depends on the first k level of exponent. So it is lambda one, the largest, lambda two, the second, lambda one, the first, the third, and so on and so forth. If the motion is regular, happens on the torus, and this is the most important thing to keep is in mind is that value remains practically constant. The volume in some sense remains constant. We will take only two vectors for practical reasons because you have a system with 1000 degrees of freedom or more, and you have to evolve two deviation vectors with 1000, uh, coordinates, it will be much harder to have more. This is the sign. This is the sign. Yeah. Actually, and I'm saying that this is the sign, which is hidden. Yeah. So we have a quantity which goes exponentially fast to zero if we have chaos and remains more or less constant if we have regular motion. That's, that's the, the main idea. And now we do the following. Now we are trying to understand how things change if the overall perturbation becomes smaller and smaller. So we have the, our system, the energy, the total energy of the system is in some sense a nonlinearity strength because as this goes, becomes smaller, the system becomes closer and closer to the regular behavior. And we are trying to understand that and don't forget, we have also some kind of randomness because we take different disorder realization. So what is happening is we do the following. 
we keep the energy at some value and we take 100 different disorder realizations. We compute the evolution of the second moment participation number and we try to understand how many of them are chaotic or not. If the energy is very large, all of them will be chaotic. But if the energy becomes smaller and smaller, we are approaching more and more the linear part of the linear version of the system. This should not be the case. So look here are three different realizations for the same total energy. The thing that is changing is the sequence of these random numbers in FOCA. So if we, the total energy is again the same. The, the experiment is the same. We excited, I don't know if I say that, only one side at the middle. The parameters of the whole system is, is the, are the same. So here you see the evolution up to 10 to the 9 of the second moment. This is one realization, one particular random arrangement, another realization, another one. So look, here we see that the second moment remains constant throughout the evolution. The participation number, how many sites are highly excited remains constant. This gives you an idea that this probably is definitely is localization because you do not have spreading. But if you compute the Lyapunov exponent for this system, you see that the Lyapunov exponent goes to zero with a slope of minus one. That should mean regular behavior. And if I compute the, the gully two, which is the solid, you see that remains practically constant. So this is regular motion. Now we have another case for the same overall parameters. The only difference is the random realization where we see that the second moment participation number remains practically constant localization. There is no real spreading. But if you compute the Lyapunov exponent, you see that at some point, there is some kind of deviation from the flow of minus one, which if you see that, you realize that the system is practically weakly chaotic. But if you compute the value two, you see that the appearance of eventual chaos is quite obvious because the gully abruptly goes to zero, which is 10 to the minus eight. So this is a case of localization. The energy is not spreading, but chaos. So we have regular motion and localization, localization and chaotic behavior. And here is another case where you see, for the same system again, where you see the second moment is eventually growing, spreading. The participation number eventually starts growing, spreading, and you see again that the Lyapunov exponent is definitely not going to zero. The Gali again gives you the goes to zero, which means chaos. So here we have three cases: regular motion, localized chaos, spreading chaos. And you can the idea of using the Gali is because it is easier instead of inspecting the evolution of the Lyapunov exponent, you just see if it is. Zero, that means chaos. I mean, you should not have the difference of the last one. I mean, if it's localized, no, but then you have also to, yeah, very well. So here we have for these three cases snapshots of the energy distribution at two at, at three different times 10 to the 5, 10 to the 9, 10, 10 to the 7, 10 to the 9. And you see that for the regular motion, the three distributions practically overlap, no spreading. That's what we see here. Here we start seeing some spreading towards the end, but again, by just looking at that, you cannot really understand if this is chaotic or not, but this index is telling you that. And here we have some spreading, which again, it's if you compare the red and the black, you see that there is some spreading, slow spreading, but also this index is telling you that it is chaos. So using these ideas, we can have, we can characterize cases as regular, localized chaos or spreading chaos. And if we can do that for one energy or one parameter, let's forget the Ws. Let's, so we can see that as we are decreasing the energy, this is in log scale, then what we would expect is that everything will become regular because the energy, the perturbation is very small. The system, the phase space is covered practically everywhere with uh, invariant tori in many degrees of freedom, you will not have chaos or chaos will be very small. If you want, uh, Arnold diffusion could happen there. So here is the percentage of chaotic orbits according to the Gali identification. 
And you see that as we go to smaller energies, we are starting from 100% and we go down. And then we can also do something more. We can discriminate between chaos, but localized or spreading chaos. So here we see the spreading chaos and the localized chaos, the percentages. As we go to smaller energies, you see that when we have chaos, all chaos or higher energies, practically all chaotic cases are spreading chaotic cases. So there is also spreading. But as we move to more lower uh, energies, the, the percentage of cases where we have chaotic behavior, which remains localized, is increasing. And then at sm even smaller re uh, regions of the energy, we have practically all, all the cases that they are chaotic, they are localized chaos, and eventually the percentage goes to zero, which means that everything is regular. And I, I think it's not necessary to, to go into the details here because here we have describing also different kinds of excitations. But the idea is that as the strength of nonlinearity, as we are approaching the linear limit of the model, we start having uh, uh, chaos, but localized chaos, and eventually all cases will become regular. And this is something that you can easily visualize using the, the Gali uh, uh, indicator. And that's it. So what I try to do is to remind you some numerical techniques for studying dynamical systems, the chaoticity, but also in like, for example, the frequency map analysis or, or the level of exponent, but also to give you a flavor of some other approaches that we are using in order to understand this dynamics like, for example, division vector distributions and the Gali, but in this particular aspect of discriminating between localized and spreading chaos. So there's no reason to really go through all these details, but that's the main message that I wanted to pass. Please keep in mind these techniques, which could be useful in some of the applications that people might uh, study. And here is a list of references where uh, all these ideas have been developed in the last, okay, the, the Sally Gali was introduced 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, but these other papers where we applied all these ideas to the, <coughs> the particular model are more recent and the latest one was here in 2004, uh, to last year, these two papers with one of my former PhD students, Bob and uh, uh, Sergei Flach here, where we used the uh, frequency map analysis and also the idea of Gali for discriminating between localized and spreading chaos. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Harris. Time for questions, Anoli. Well, a question that, that goes back to the uh, um, conservative to the system. This is a conservative system, so it conserves energy. My question is, if you have some dissipative curves, so if you're losing them, are all these, I understand that you have issues with Hamiltonian, but is chaos sustained with dissipative curves? Because we have systems in the sun, for example, uh, in which you lose energy in each and every uh, action of mm -hmm. different days. And uh, there is discussion about chaos versus stochasticity, uh, which is a different thing. Actually, so my question is, if you put some dissipative terms in there, were you able to see something of that behavior? Okay, that's, that's a very good question. One of the things that I have been trying for many years to do is to move all these ideas to dissipative systems. So what I have done is I have studied some simple, slightly dissipative systems. Let's put it this way. If you have a system and a parameter, and the parameter is one, the system is conservative. And then you just change the parameter, if you put it 0 0.95 or whatever, then the system is has many of the characteristics of the, the conservation, but it is losing energy, but not all, uh, yeah, what is the conserved quantity, phase, space, volume, whatever. If this is not too fast, and of course too fast depends on the system, then these things can be still seen because you, you see, in order to do this computation, you need sometime windows, 
if these time windows are large enough in order to have a reliable computation, but not larger than the, 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 the time that the energy is dissipating. So if it is slightly dissipative, then you can see these patterns again. If it is more dissipative, you understand here I have a difficulty of defining large and more, then if it is very fast, if dissipation is quite strong, then you cannot really apply all these things. You, you lose the, the information because you have uh, attractors, you have you lose dimensionality, things. Like that. But if things are slow, if you are in the close to the conservative limit or slightly dissipative, whatever that means, but you get the meaning, then you can still use these ideas or, and you get some results which has some meaning. So it might be useful in that region. Well, this is understandable, yes. I mean, you, you need to have some, some good degree of, of observation of the energy so that will not quench this kind of exactly. Energy. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> This person may be completely out of place. You, you move 10 oscillators. What if you move 500 of them? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so let me go back. Oh, not that back. Here. <laughs> so here is a, a diagram of the parameter space of our system. There are one parameter is. W, let me, this is something that I skipped to, uh, let's go back here. So you see here we have the parameter which is W. This W is defining the strength of the disorder in the following sense. <clears throat> if W is very, very large, then this term becomes negligible. So this term is more important. So W large means disorder is very strong. And actually in that case you have practical localization everywhere. If W is very small, then this is large, this term becomes more important. So this is not that important. So the, the disorder strength is, the disorder is not that influential. So here we have a parameter space through our theory where you have the different regimes of hair weak years. And here is the, the energy, the nonlinearity, which is practically the energy. So if you play with different parameters here, and you're still in this region or that region, you will have the same behavior. So just to respond now to what you are actually asking. Yes, you can have larger, uh, more extended uh, excitations. And I think that here, for example, you see, uh, I have excited 37 sites, 21 sites, 13 sites. And you can still, depending on how, in which region of the phase space you are, you can still see this, this kind of patterns. The problem is the following. And by the way, these numbers are not random numbers. They are detect, uh, defined by the fact of what is the localization length of the system, but let's not go to that direction. The problem is practical. I can also find weak chaos and strong chaos cases with when I excite many degrees of freedom. But what will happen is that the energy will reach the boundaries. And then depending on how we have, our system has fixed boundary conditions and it is large enough in order to never reach the boundaries because then you will include. Uh, so that's the only practical reason that you do not have very large initial excitations because if you have very large initial excitations you will reach the boundaries very soon and then you have to stop because otherwise you have feedback yeah well, yeah so cpus but we have in parallel because uh, in parallel in many because you mentioned several days for it yes uh, but CPUs, we see acceleration enormous i know i know so just, just to give you an idea about the times, when I started working on that and I was writing my codes at uh, the codes 2008, 2010, in order to reach 10 to the nine for one realization, it was three days, not in a PC, three days in uh, Now my students are more advanced than, than me and they are doing parallelization of the codes, different cores, and they are managing to do this huge computation. I, understand, I, I completely agree with you with GPUs. The, the only practical issue that somebody has to 
be trained in order to do that, and I have not found somebody so far. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. build a GPU device. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's a, a, a good point, yeah. You can only have some material over there to give you. So, yeah. Back. So, Mirella, I think. Uh, when you uh, talk about the weak air to your system, uh, this is something that uh, has to do with the uh, stickiness, or is it something like no, it's localized? No, it is local, it's localized. Localized. Yes. Okay. It is not. It is not. So not the apple something. It, right? No, no. It, it no, it is not about stickiness. It is about. It is actually eventually not even localized, but the spreading is slower than what we yeah. call strong chaos. You don't, you don't see any. Well, actually, stickiness phenomena you start seeing when you go to smaller and smaller energies. And yeah, that's nice how people see it from different ways. So, so look, this is sticky because you see it takes, here you do not really see excitations of many degrees of freedom. The energy or the oscillators that they still have energy is more or less the same because participation number, but you start seeing this deviation. And this, of course, sometimes, I cannot- Sometimes, so sometimes. Yeah. Like so, a, so this is a sticky behavior in some multi-dimensional variety. I don't even try to visualize that, but that's another way of seeing that. So this is sticky orbit, and this is in some sense a sticky orbit, which yes. went easier to do the chaotic scene. And that's because other weak is something else. Nims also higher dimensional objects mm -hmm. than periodic objects. It also can be inside the nims. It's not uh, maybe sticking it. We don't know actually. No, no, we do not know, but it's also have also trapping in the higher dimensional uh, tori and have other then other diffusion. We have many effects. It's not only the figures as to know to yeah. this and maybe three degrees of people. I agree. I agree, but what and, uh, this uh, next uh, my next question. Can these uh, indicators detect Type dimension of like NIMS, for example, they try to use uh, these detectors in order to have to detect a normal hyperbolic environment. So, or using machine learning, using this technique, that, like George Meyer okay. in Germany. That's, that's a good question. I'm not really sure. I will just give some ideas. I, I, I don't think that I have an answer. But what you could try to do is the following. I'm not saying that it is easily doable. So, here, you have Gali K and uh, higher order. So, for example, if you have some kind of regular behavior into yeah. some region which is of higher dimensions. So, let's put it this way. If this object has dimension five in whatever. So, if you compute value of two, three, four, five, and this is regular part, and then you will find a constant. If you go to six, you will find, I don't want to end the details, if something, although the, the object is regular, the motion of the object is regular, you will find a decrease to zero. So that could be used as an indicator of finding the dimensionality of the system. Yeah. So we have used this approach in order to find low dimensional tori. We had a system of eight degrees of freedom and we could identify initial conditions that will Give you regular motion, but on the torus of or, of dimension four or five. And it is very helpful if you can combine this with geometrization of the problem. Oh yeah, but this is a uh, better this for example is Isaac Hamedri, and the throw mm -hmm. Pellini method to detect this motion by bifurcation that you have, and maybe using Gali to detect if you have uh, okay. uh, what uh, objects you have. Yeah, so let, let's put it this way. If you have objects where regular mo regular motion, not chaotic, regular motion yeah. occurs, you might be able to use Gali in order to get a feeling about the dimensionality of the object. That's, that's my bottom line. And we have done that for a system of FPU lattice where we used it in order to find low dimensional tori of, or, or two dimensional tori in eight dimensional phase space using this approach. That's, and this could be something that people can- Another interesting uh, question is that uh, can we use these uh, techniques in order to use localized chaos or uh, mm. chaos and to use these techniques in order to have dimensionality reduction? Okay. So actually, that's that's the main idea behind all this 
discussion. Well, we would like to identify low dimensional chaos or chaotic hotspots. Um, so that's what I try to, to, to give you a flavor here. I don't have a definite answer. I'm not saying that I can do it, but all these approaches can somehow give you an idea. For example, the deviation vector distribution is telling you that only 10 sites always are the more chaotic, and you can also have an idea of where they are. The frequency map analysis also can identify regions where things are more unpredictable and chaotic. So all these things is along this idea. But Gali, for example, cannot really do that because if it is chaotic, even in few degrees of freedom, it will give you the overall chaoticity. The maximum level of exponent cannot do that because it is something about the whole system. So you cannot identify yeah, regions. Yeah. That's why we use the best ideas that we had in order to find or go into the direction of identifying localized chaos or chaotic hotspots where the, the DVD and maybe the frequency map analysis. It's very important because not only models that this is, this is a big question. Yeah, that actually, the techniques for them because actually you have thousand degrees. You try to uh, so, so the important degrees of freedom that uh, in order to have a Hamiltonian for uh, uh, lower dimensions. I agree. So what I would say from what I have presented here, probably the, the closest idea, which might be of some use, as you see, I'm trying to be very careful here how I express things, would be the deviation vector distributions, because they tell you which sites at particular time are more chaotic, more with quotation marks. Yeah. Well, let's stop the discussion yeah, here and maybe we can continue. Yeah. Thank you so much. Ωραία, αυτό μπορείτε να δημιουργήσετε, μπορείτε να το κρατήσετε, δεν έχουμε ένα πρόβλημα. Ωραία, ωραία.